Okay, hi guys. Uh, my name is Taposhi. I am the events organizer for the student council at the True School of Music, Mumbai. It's really exciting to have all you guys here uh, for this masterclass. This is the first masterclass we are having online, so it's pretty nerve-wracking for us as well. Uh, especially with the internet situation and the lockdown, it's it's pretty it's pretty uh, amazing the turnout that we have already. Uh, so just a quick. Uh, introduction. Uh, we have Maria Franz from Helung, which is a Danish German and uh, band from Norway. Uh, they do ritualistic uh, shamanic music, and we have Natasha Pakalenko from Nitland. Uh, they are a Siberian uh, folk dark folk band from Siberia, Russia. Uh, they are going to talk about the history of shamanic music and they are also going to talk about throat singing. Uh, Natasha is going to tell you about the throat singing bit and Maria is going to talk about more Nordic vocal techniques like pulling and building uh, the power of your voice. Uh, and I think uh, we have enough participants right now to start the masterclass. So we will start with Natasha because she's going to talk about, uh, walk us through the history. Uh, so Natasha, over to you. Thank you very much. Also, uh, before you start, I forgot all the participants who are here already. Uh, during the masterclass, if you have any questions while they are talking, please put that on the chat and we will try to answer as many as possible. After the session is done, we'll, we are going to open it up for Q&A so that you can directly talk with the Artist 101 and put forward your questions. If that's okay with you all, just give me a thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> nice okay. to see you all. Today, I would like to talk about tradition cultures, about Scandinavian cultures and about Siberian cultures, about music and a little about instrument. For those who don't know, I am the vocalist of Midland Band, my husband Anatoly Pahalenka and I. We have been making music for many years and we are also historians. Sometimes we give uh, some lectures at the University at Faculty of History in our city. Uh, and like a historian in our music, we combine the Scandinavian tradition and Siberian traditions. Um, so I will talk a little more about the elements of these traditions today. Um, I want to say that uh, in our music, we are not doing a um, reconstruction. It is uh, music for us. It is a subjective reflection of reality, maybe. You know, uh, it is our world view. But of course, we we use many elements of of different traditional cultures, uh, like a historian. Uh, it is important for us, uh, we can use uh, real historical, uh, maybe ancient materials like, for example, something sources like Elder Edda, for example, like some texts from our Siberian tribes, uh, songs, yes, you know, um, there are songs uh, that was created many centuries ago and now in today we can touch the ancients it's very very incredible yes we um, we interesting to work with ritual songs um for example hanke hanke it is siberian tribes it is people who thousands of um, years passed uh these songs uh, by uh, word to how uh, in English. Sorry for my English. My English is not very good. Uh, by um, you know, it is songs. It is ancient songs. It's it's amazing. We can read this text now, right now. It's amazing. So you know, now the folk and ethnic, it is trend it is becoming very popular for example in cinema in music yes you know historical series it is popularity ethnic and folk festivals many festivals all over the world mm, you know many 
folk band, metal folk, folk metal band, Viking band. I am not good in new styles. There are more and more of them, but I think it's very cool. It is interesting. It seems to me that people more often began to to look back into the past. Yes, and it is special connection is felt between the ancient past and the um, present. Yes, it is great when people have and keep a memory of the roots, memory of their culture, it is amazing. But I think uh, it is now ethnic style is like a pop culture. When it's happened, um, a lot of fakes, a lot of pseudo scientific articles and books appear, a lot of speculation. Um, and as a historian, I want to talk a little more about some of the topics that are relevant today because people begin to confuse real historicism and fictional trends. I want to start with shamanism. This is very popular topic right now. First, I will tell you about traditional shamanism in Siberia. Uh, then maybe we talk a little about shamanism in music, music. So, shamanism. What is shamanism? Shamanism is an early form of religion. This is due to magic, animism, totemism. Different culture have different elements of shamanism. Geographically, shamanism was and is in Siberia, Central and Southeast Asia, Africa, North and South America, and Australia, yeah, and Australia. Um, some scientists uh, say that shamanism is the oldest religion that has existed for several millennia. But you must understand that uh, a single concept of different, uh, several concept shamanism does not exist. Even within Siberia, different ethnic groups have different elements of shamanism, maybe different systems of myths and different world view. Shamanism, unlike world religions, has an important distinctive feature. Shamanism don't uh, don't have personified gods. In shamanism, people worship spirits. Of course, person personification. Yes, occurs in, in development. Uh, some spirits are called God, but in fact, the spirits remain the spirits. He doesn't uh, accue any new, maybe, abilities or functions. Everything remains within the tradition. Of course, um, what is the shamanism without shaman? Who is the shaman? Uh, the term shaman. Uh, is used in many languages. Languages. Um, there, there are many versions of uh, of the origin of this word. The main version version of its origin from from the word saman. It is word from from the language of Evenki people. Maybe you know. Event it is Eastern Siberia. Uh, formerly there were Tungus, maybe you hear Tungus, maybe you hear about the Tungus meteorite. Yeah, it is here. Uh, some scientists suggest that the word shaman comes from ancient India. Yes, comes from Sanskrit Shraman. If, if I'm not mistaken, Shraman. Yes. It, it means something like ascetic, I, I think. Yes, there are many versions of origin and distribution of the world. Uh, in, in general, each nation uh, 
uh, has its own name for shaman. For example, in Siberia, different ethnic groups have different names for shaman. For example, in Yakutia, uh, shaman is Oyun. Evenki people said the shaman it is shaman, saman. In Buryatia, shaman is ba, uh, Bashakti. Bashakti, I, I don't remember. Uh, in Altai, shaman is Sam. In Tuva, shaman is Ham. Among the Sami, shaman is Noida. You know, the Sami, uh, it is one. It is one tribe in Europe who um, have shamanism. Only Sami have shamanism in Europe. I know that they have long been uh, persecuted uh, as, as heretics. It is good that this culture uh, has survived to, to the present day, which is amazing. So, what about Shaman? In, in North America, yes, North American Indians, Shaman is a dante. You know, um, it is very interesting fact about North American people, North American Indian, Indians. Um, you know that they are descendants of the Siberian tribes. This is not my fantasy. <laughs> a lot of research has been done, including genetic and ethnographic researches. Yes, modern North American Indians are um, descendants of immigrants from Siberia. Recently, there were several waves of migration. This is due to climate change. Yes, they used um, an isthmus as the place of the Bering Strait through which migration took place. I have one friend, uh, his name is Timofey Maldanov. He is historian and also he is a hunt. Hunter is one of, of indigenous people of Siberia. He advised us when we were working on a new album. Um, we used to do some songs of the hunter. And he said that so far different North American tribes have some common elements with different families of Siberian hunter in clothes, in ornaments, in worship of spirits. Uh, in general, we will not delve deeply into this issue. Um, we have not enough, ti enough time for this. So, I think we need to talk about shaman. Who is the shaman? Shaman is a person who mediates between people and spirits. It is believed the shaman can see a different uh, special reality and travel in it. I want to know that the shaman is the chosen one of spirits. This means that shamans become not of their own free will. This cannot be learned or taught. You can become a shaman only by the will of spirit which is still in the shaman. And therefore, probably the most important thing of a real shaman is the process which in science, science is called um, shamanic illness. This is the process of becoming, becoming a shaman. The process of instilling the spirit into a shaman. It is like, it's something like obsession, I think. This usually occurs in childhood. Not all people can survive this process. This is due um, to so maybe mental and uh, physical pain. It is may seem that a person 
suffers from some kind of psychiatric um, illness. Yes. This is, was a problem for some time. Very often people suffering from shamanic illness were um, taken to psychiatric clinics. Of course, uh, they could not be cured. Respectively, people either died or remained in the clinic, clinic until their days, death. Um, so. Uh, Natasha, can yeah? we, just sorry to interrupt. Uh, so there is uh, a, an issue with the audio. Uh, is there any way like you can go to the settings on Zoom and just suppress the background noise? I can just walk you through it. Can you hear me? A bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, so there is, can you, can you see a mute option uh, at the bottom on Zoom? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so just click on that arrow next to the mute option. Mm -hmm. uh, go to audio settings. Okay, yes. Okay, do you see an advanced option? Yes. Click on that. Mm -hmm. And there is this option called suppress persistent background noise. Mm -hmm. Is it on auto? Yes. Okay, uh, just go to aggressive. <laughs> so I can it's really, yeah, I think uh, <laughs> this should just stop once and let's check if it's better. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Is it, is it better for everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Try to okay. speak a little more, uh, Natasha. Uh, I'm here. Hello. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> it's a bit think, better now. Huh? Yeah, I think it's better now. Okay. Yeah. And if oh. you if you could just if you could like lean into the screen and <laughs> talk, maybe. Okay. just a little bit. Yeah. I will talk maybe like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um. Okay, human just uh, cannot just call himself a shaman. It doesn't depend on person's desire. Now many people call themselves shamans. I read one interview with a woman from Russia who considers herself a shaman. It is very funny because she said uh, that she had a shamanic illness in childhood. Uh, that manifested like a uh, silver cold. Yes, it, it was very fun. So, shaman, the shaman, uh, cannot fully control the spirit that is instilled in him or with whom he uh, communicates. He's only intermediary in communicating with spirits. He can call, he can talk with him, ask for something, but he cannot force him to do anything. Um, to involve the spirits or to communicate with it, rituals of devotion. Yes, I used rituals of devotion. Uh, the shaman enter maybe in trance or experience an altered state of um, consciousness. Usually, a shamans for, for it, um, use different instruments. For example, it may be mouth harp, it may be hand drum, it may be some maybe dance and special rhythms. Everything is individual here. Uh, there is no special special instruction for calling rain and for calling uh, the some spirit. Um, spirits do not always respond to the call of the shaman. When the shaman enters into a trance, he travels to other worlds. Uh, in Siberian shamanism, there is an idea of three worlds: the upper heavenly world, middle, it is earthy spirits, and lower underground world. It is interesting fact, uh, in shamanism, there is, is 
uh, the word three, which unites the world. Do you feel the analogy with Norse mythology? The Scandinavian also have a word three, is Dresi, which connected nine words Asgard, Midgard, Jotunheim, uh, Niflheim, Vanaheim, Muspelheim. We lost you, Natasha. She, she got stuck. Yes. <laughs> she saw, she got stuck in a, in, a, in a different world right now. By the time she mentioned Helheim, she froze. She froze. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, come back to <laughs> let me Let me see if she's responsive. Uh, on I think Baldur will save her now. Try to run from the chat, see if yeah, she's... Uh... Yeah. I hope she's checking the chat or else she's just going to be stuck like that. Hello? I Hi, you. Yay, you're back! Hi. I got you back from... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my internet is not very good. Could yeah, you right. hear us? Small, small village. <laughs> Yes. So you got stuck just when you mentioned Helheim. Okay. So, uh, what about? Okay. Um, I think we can speak about shamanism in modern music, yes? However, um, many bands use external elements of traditional shamanism in music and in shows. It, it can be costumes with elements of shamanism. These are special hats. I know Maria have one of these, yeah? It is a um, fringe that hides the face. Yes, it is traditional shamanism. And, and that is directly, to, directly inspired by a finding from an ancient grave in Siberia. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe it's very similar symbols, uh, embroidery, maybe some elements of shamanic dance yes you can see a lot of scenes on the stage and um, i think it is interesting but you need to understand this is not the construction experience and some kind of performance have a right to be i think this helps um preserve the memory of the past of course sometimes this memory is deformed yes people too um literally perceive what the musician show so as for my band new friends you can see the traditional instruments that i use in rituals we use mouth harp and frame drums in siberia frame drum is called a shaman's horse this is instrument um it is like a tool that helps a shaman for traveling between the world. Yes, we have two frame drums uh, by, made by Siberian craftsmen. One of them was made by an old shaman from Tuva. This instrument has a wonderful deep sound. <laughs> like many acoustic instruments made from um, natural materials, this is frame drum is very moody it, it reacts very strongly to change in temperature and humidity um, it needs uh, special care yes uh, traditionally craftsmen recommend um, recommend using animal fat but it is uh, have side effect it's very very strong smell <laughs> Yes, and um, in our music we use um, mouth harps. We, I have two. It is Vietnamese and it is from Altai. In general, there are many types of um, mouth harp. In Russia, we called it Vargan. Uh, Altai, Vietnamese, Hakkas, Turkmen, and so on. In different countries, um, they have different names. It's like with shamans. <laughs> For example, Vietnamese mouse harp 
it's called Dan Moy. This is a um, solid metal plate with, with a cut on top in the middle. It is fragile enough, yeah. Um, okay, it's called Comus. Yes, it is different from Vietnamese here. We see the forged frame and the tongue, metal tongue. Um, mouse heart can be made um, of different materials. It may be metal, it may be wood, and it may be bone, it may be bamboo. I heard that in India there are also mouse harps. Uh, I don't remember, I think it is more chan, something like this. More chan. Yes. More sing or more chan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think about this. The principal affection of the mouse harp is simple. Depending on the type of mouse harp, uh, you either press it to your teeth, or, or for example, this altar. Yeah. Press to your teeth, or for example, Vietnamese, clamp it your lips. Your head is like a resonator. <laughs> By changing the position of the tone, you can change the sound. Breathing is very important here for a good sound. For example, Vietnam, Vietnamese, you harp, mouth harp, mm, you can make a sound without your, your, your fingers. I don't know, are you listening? Yeah. Yes. So, and one of mm, main element from Siberian shamanism music. Yes, it is throat singing. Yes, you know, throat singing is a traditional vocal technique of the people from Siberia, Tibet, Mongolia. Um, and I heard about Italian something, yes, but I I know I don't know what is what is technical. I know about Siberian, Mongolian, and Tibetan. Uh, West European cultures have no tradition in the practice of throat singing. This vocal technique is uh, in the tradition of maybe South American tribes and Canadian Inuit. Inuit. But Can in I general, say one, Can I say one thing, Natasha? Can I just say one thing to that? Because uh, we don't know, actually. We have a description from an Arabic traveler, Ibn Fadl Adlan. He uh, traveled through, um, through Europe in the Viking Age, and he described their singing as the screaming and barking of dogs and barrels uh, with uh, nails falling down. And uh, he said you could hear more than one tone in, in the singing. And when we interpret this to our age, it sounds like the only vocal technique that he can be talking about was throat singing, but we don't know. But that's the one gram of, of history we, we can... You know, I, I never heard about it. Uh, I, I read many, some research, and I will consulting with some um, specialist on uh, Scandinavian tradition and all people who make some research in, in these um, topics, yes, all people say that Scandinavian, it is no, there is no this practice of thought singing. I don't know, maybe Maybe it's my mistake, <laughs> but um, I don't want to tell about things which I don't know. Yeah. In, so I know that um, throughout singing, it is, it is Asian style, generally. Maybe, maybe 
maybe you um, in in Scandinavia maybe it was something some um, some type of Scenic. I don't know. I never heard about this later. I don't know. That's yeah. their theory. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I need to check it. <laughs> Thank you. I'll send you the link. <laughs> Natasha, we have a question regarding uh, shamanism, probably because uh, uh, they missed out on the first bit of the uh, master class. So the, uh, the Alex wants to know uh, when was shamanism what is the estimated origin of shamanism what timeline and uh, he would like to know how is this first religion uh, related to african history and old tribes of africa shamanism shamanism is this all this it is was before paganism you know because shamanism and paganism have um uh, have uh, one maybe um, united elements but shamanism some scientists told about several millennia yes, some some uh, of um, tribes who have shamanism now for example in Siberia they um, you know they have have a uh, written language only only from maybe the first part of 20th century before this the these tribes have not any any letters any any uh, writing language yet you know um and they keep this tradition for many many maybe it, it was centuries we don't know maybe it was hundreds years we don't know like historians we have not the historical historian sources it's not found now so i have not many time i, I have many information <laughs> so i think it's time to talk about what thing what thing i i talk what is it yes uh, there are have many types of throat singing. Each region has its own styles. I will tell you about to what throat singing, to why it's Siberian region. Okay. Mm. There are have uh, several main types of Tuan throat singing. I will talk about Kargira. You know, they have Sigit, Homey, and Kargira. They differ in pitch and, and sound in general. Um, for example, Sigit is highest, it uses the main tone and overtone, yes. As for Kargira, this is a low overtone singing with a golden sound. It is generally accepted that this is a male technique, but there are exceptions. <laughs> Some women have successfully mastered this technique. Kargira is a um, vocal technique in which um, a singer can make three sounds in one time. It is low, in, like growl, yes, a typical, maybe like stompas, <laughs> but a little, little different. It is maybe like snoring. Uh, the second sound is it is your main tone, main voice note, and over tone. Yes. Uh, it seems it sounds like this. <laughs> Some Siberian people compare this sound with the sound of a beer, bear. Uh, it's like a lullaby that a bear sings to her little bit. Maybe. <laughs> everyone, everyone, absolutely everyone can learn throat singing. This is nothing complicated. No need to have any 
any outstanding vocal skills. Yeah. I will show you some exercises. So, the first exercise, you need to understand how to extract sound at all. The first and most necessary condition, it is stone breath, vocal support. Nothing will work without it, yes. So, the first exercise, we need to learn how to strain properly. Tighten your stomach opening. Imagine that you that you are lifting something very, very heavy, something like this. Yes, it's funny. <laughs> Tighten your stomach and make a such sound. But your throat uh, must be relaxed. The second exercise, um, I call it snoring. <laughs> you need to relax your throat and imitate snoring. Very important, do not, do not uh, use your nose. Yes. You need to snore by, by your throat. I repeat this exercise several times a day. Yes. And the third, sorry, <laughs> the third exercise is this. We combine the first two exercises. You need to strain and snore at the same time. This is where the sound of raw singing comes from. Most likely, the first few days you will not get a clear sound. You hear? Yes. yes. You yourself will feel and hear when the desired sound appears. For me, it took, I, I think, two days maybe to catch the sound. The first days, it cannot be kept, but it all you need only practice. So, when you begin to learn thoughts, you begin to feel discomfort in the throat. It's it's matter. Throat may maybe you feel some pain. You can even start coughing during exercise. Therefore, it is very important to observe safety measures. As soon as you begin to feel pain or discomfort in the throat, you need to stop. You can continue the exercise when uh, this discomfort goes away. If you continue to exercise despite pain or discomfort, you can run the risk of losing your voice. At the best, you will horse for a couple of days. At first, damage your vocal cords. Must be careful. So, when you have learned how to make sounds, you need to find your comfortable note. Each person has his own note. This is the note in which you are most comfortable and easy to extract sound. I have a note of soy, G maybe. Um, my husband has la, yes, but we are in different octaves. And man, uh, as a rule, short singing is low, yes, the, the characteristic of body. Uh, when you find a note, you need to train to hold it as long as possible. <laughs> Um, so, find the most comfortable note. You can use a tuner or piano or find it. Um, when you learn how to make a sound, you found the note, you can start the next workout. I recommend the following exercise. You start with a comfortable note and sing different sounds. For example, A, O, U, A, E like this. 
You can try to sing uh, your tate sounds like ya, ye, yo, ye. When you learn this, you can start singing some words and words that go into your head. Something like this. So next step, we need to learn how to um, instantly take sound. No overclocking like this. Without this, I train it to eat this Russian word tractor and you can use any other word yeah, you can find in it when you learn to sing completely on one note you can try to sing along notes maybe some small melody do not count on them um, uh, large merge. Usually it is smaller than you, your usual vocal merge. Yes. When you uh, when you started to learn this technique, you must be careful. I told about that, and you, you need to be careful because it's dangerous for your voice. I hope I managed to form a general idea of Siberian culture. Now, yes, I have not many time, but. I think we can talk about Scandinavian culture, yes? Asha, yeah. before, before we move on, uh, we have a question about the second technique that you talked about, the snoring one. Could you repeat that? And someone has also asked if it's similar to vocal fry. Okay, um, snoring, it is exercise for carburetor technique. Yes, your throat is relaxing and it is when you sleep and yes, it's snoring. <laughs> by uh, it is snoring by your throat. No, don't use your nose. It's look like this. And with the first exercise, you will keep your sound in uh, throat singing sound. Okay. I think uh, we can even move on to Scandinavia. Yeah. All right. You know, um, I think now um, in the world, Scandinavian culture is very popular. Yeah. Um, every day, maybe yes, there are new Viking music band around the world. I think that this musical direction has already um, already been formed yes but now people have false ideas about the Scandinavian culture I will tell you a little about the real historical understanding of the Scandinavian culture and tradition um, the first the beginning of of the Viking era officially is considered an attack on the um, Lindisfarne monastery 
I think it was in 793 years. Yeah. Of course, there are earlier references to Scandinavian burial travelers in European sources, but the attack on, on uh, Lindisfarne was the starting point from which the Norman invasion began. This is this is the uh, beginning of the era. Important point, not all Scandinavians were Vikings. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For example, in Scandinavia was bonds. Yes, you know, bonds, it is uh, free farmers. Yes. For example, trellis, it is slave. Yes, I will, I will not give you a lecture on the history of Scandinavia. You can read it, uh, this in history books and I will tell you a little about culture and tradition and what you. So, Vikings were warriors. It is some, maybe something like pirates. Yes, fierce warriors in European historical sources uh, have descriptions of their attacks. It is said that these are strong big people. Uh, sometimes they were compared with, um, with the devilish army. Uh, they have no, they had um, no equal in battle. They were not afraid of death. It was an honor for them to die on, on the battle. Yes, and textual historical stories, various sagas, uh, Elder Red, for example. Yes, uh, we can we can make some maybe portrait of these people. So I think I have no time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you can finish whatever you were saying, and then we'll move on to. Okay. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many information. <laughs> yes, I think maybe later we we can. Yes, definitely. About. I think maybe what what we should have one master class just on the history because there's so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's so much. Yes. Okay, I think Natasha, are you done? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Time for Maria. <laughs> over to Maria. Maria, could you take over? <laughs> Of course, thank you so much, Takoshi, and thank you so much, Natasha. It's very, very interesting to hear from a Siberian historical point of view because we, of course, we hugely influenced by the shamanic culture from your place of origin. So it's uh, deeply fascinating to hear you tell about it. Thank you so much. So uh, yeah, and thanks for the ball. I'm catching it and taking over from the Scandinavian side. My name is uh, Maria Franz and I'm uh, from Norway. Uh, currently I'm in Copenhagen, outside Copenhagen in Denmark, where we have an audio studio, um, where we are working a lot these days when we cannot go out and play live. So that's where I am right now. And Taposhi, I want to ask you because you, uh, prepared some wonderful questions for me. Do you want me to just, do you want to ask them and then I answer or um, uh, how do you want to? I think, I think we can do the Q&A thingy and you can, uh, whenever, whenever uh, you can just go in your flow after one question. If I ever feel like you're not covering some topic, then I can just jump in and ask you that. Uh, does that work? That works fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yes. we can start with you talking a little bit about your musical background with your different projects and especially with Gelang, uh, and how how you guys came about and what's the basic idea that uh, behind Gelang. Yeah. 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 Sure. So um, Heilung consists of uh, three founders. It's uh, me from Norway and Christopher Jewell from Denmark and Kai Oberfaust from Germany. And uh, Christopher and uh, Kai and me have been working with uh, reenactment of our Viking history for many, many years. So we met through that scene where for people who are not acquainted with it, it goes like this, that it starts with that you have an interest for history. 
And then it starts, it continues with you reading up a lot about what have been excavated and uh, what have we found of pieces of uh, clothes and pottery and instruments and uh, weapons and everything. And then uh, we go into reconstructing all these items. And so that means if you are interested in blacksmithing, you will probably go that path and uh, study everything about how to make weapons and try to make them as historically correct. Then you tried to wield this uh, sword to see, okay, was it really right? Is the balance right? And we perform all this uh, showing and telling on big markets across Europe uh, and many other places as well. So I started when I was 12 uh, doing Viking reenactment in Norway, in Borre, beautiful Borre with the biggest gathering of grave mounts in, uh, in Europe. And uh, through this interest, I went through the whole specter. I went from bow and arrow to fighting to pottery to making, of course, making clothes. You have to learn how to sew and weave and everything to make your outfits. And then very quickly, I found uh, music and was deeply fascinated by the whole idea of sitting around the campfire at night and uh, sharing stories and songs from all over the world. It's a very multinational um, community. So it's people from Australia and Finland and England and Germany and Russia. And uh, there's, so you have this whole melting pot of, of cultures uh, sharing. So uh, I found uh, my interest of folk music in this environment where you get introduced for so many techniques from from so many places and it, it sang with my heart and it made me really passionate about discovering more um so Heilung uh, just to start with uh, with that um Kai Christopher and me met on one of these uh, Viking reenactment markets many 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 years ago and we had a common interest in the whole uh, historical uh, part of it. But Chris and me were always musicians, uh, or since we were very young. Um, and then Kai was, uh, is a famous uh, tattoo artist and is deeply, deeply rooted in Nordic culture and uh, spirituality, religion, shamanism, has been studying it for years and years. He uh, grew up in a very, very uh, historically heavy area in, in Germany where you can still walk on Roman paths and, you know, there's a lot of grave, grave mounts and stuff. So, uh, so he came uh, into the studio five years ago and asking Chris that uh, he wrote some uh, poetry uh, and he was performing a lot of stuff that he wanted to show to his friends because he moved from Germany to Denmark. So he asked Chris if it was possible to, um, to make a trade that he recorded his poetry and then uh, Chris would get a tattoo in return. So that sounded swell. So uh, he went into the singing booth and started recording. And the sounds that came out of that booth was just insane. You know, it was just screaming from his top of his lungs and the growling and throat singing and overtone singing. And just, he has thousand voices inside him. And Chris very, very soon saw that, okay, can I try to put some beats on this? <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so they started nerding around and, uh, and then they uh, asked me if I could jam a little bit on top of a track that they were working on. And that was in my idiom. And that was the um, first song that uh, uh, I, I joined in on. And that track is just an uh, improvisation track that I was just going in and just losing myself in it. Um, so, so that's what you hear on the recording. Uh, of that song is, is the first first tones I put on high long. So uh, so yeah, there's um, that's like briefly how how we met um, and how we formed. And the, I mean the ideology of high long came also quite um, uh, was was there from the very very beginning. Um, we wanted to create sounds that consciously aims to alter your state of mind. Uh, so both the choice of sounds and the way the compositions are built up aims to bring the listener into a, a trance-like state 
into a journey that can sometimes be turbulent, but it aims to leave you in a peace of mind when you're finished with, with listening on the album or have watched a, a, a live performance. So, so we're working very consciously with that. That is, that is the ide ideology. And hence also the name, Heilung means healing in, in German. So you said that when you, st when you started off with singing, you were initially part of an of a acoustic folk band with a lot of drummers. So you, you had, to, and we know like how challenging it is, especially for a female voices to be heard when there are so much, so many percussive elements going on. So I have two questions for you. A, uh, what is the significance of percussions with the, in, in Viking music? Because most of the music I've heard, it, it's really heavy on percussions. And how do you find your voice uh, in such a, in such a big sound, such, such a, such a big, uh, you know, especially Highland is like a huge uh, setup by itself. You already have like quite a lot of percussive players on stage. When you so how do you find your voice and how do you, how do you arrange your vocal tracks uh, according to percussions? Yes, thank you. Um... I'm going to start with the last question where um, how to find the voice uh, because yeah I also mentioned it in the in the video for where we talked about how how we, what we were going to talk about in this session and uh, yeah I started out pretty rough um, because I started playing uh, in a band with uh, four drummers that was also throat singing uh, when I was uh, 17 I think uh, so it's a while ago and there were no one else doing this at this time so we felt super nerdy and and, and uh, yeah we had a very very small uh, listening uh, crowd but uh, but yes I, I started out playing drums and and ditch actually it was uh, like a, um, a folk uh, more world music band but focused on uh, on uh, ritualistic music also and uh, they were playing, we were all playing drums, making huge drum circles and having shows that was all about just drumming, drumming, drumming like crazy and trancing out in that. And then uh, the guys was just like, oh, but Romy, it would be so cool if you, if you could sing like, if maybe we just had one song, you know, in the set to break up all the drums, like we had one song. And I remember, I think they said, oh, you're a girl, you must know how to sing. <laughs> I don't know if that's something uh, many guys think or many girls get that question, but uh, yeah, I got it. I was like, I didn't, I didn't think I could sing actually. I thought I, I knew I had a very tiny little voice. I could do just, you know, just really small, silent voice. And uh, they wanted to bring the drums into the equation. So, I very soon had to convince myself that, okay, if I can make this note, ah, then maybe I can do, use, do the same note, but then try to use more power. How would it sound like if I just pictured a volume control and I just, you know, ah, no, no, no. You know, how would I, how would I be able to, to get it out there? So volume became my first goal in singing. I needed to simply out of surviving in this uh, uh, audio uh, world, uh, I, needed, I needed volume to be able to, to perform. Um, and I think I, I never took singing lessons. I don't have like education on it. So what the, my path was to, uh, to first figure out, okay, learn my body where, where does it come from? Where does it start? Okay, I have the lungs. They need, okay, we need a lot of air, but hey, maybe not so much air anyways. Maybe we need more muscles. Maybe we need a combination. Oh, maybe I have some muscles in my back. So it was a very like physical uh, journey through my body and, uh, and a lot of self-esteem. Like you just had to, okay, I have to believe that I can do this. And also I learned quickly that to get a, a high note with full power, you kind of, you mentally also have to go there. You kind of have to pitch yourself on the top of this peak and uh, there's no return. You cannot, you cannot for one second start to think that, oh, maybe, maybe I can't do this because then you will fail and you will break and it will hurt and everything will be horrible. So you just kind of have to believe in yourself and know the basics of the support system uh, and, and that's basically how I worked myself into, 
into volume. Um, and after, after volume, it came a whole world to discover of, okay, what does other people do, native singers? What, how do they use their voice? Because it's drums, it's a lot of percussion in, the, in a lot of native music. So starting to listening into um, indigenous people from, uh, from America and uh, Sami people from Norway and the Siberian uh, um, folk music and also uh, Finnish and Swedish folk music. My first inspiration was Hedningarna, the two girls. I don't know if you guys know this band, but uh, they existed for many years. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, upbeat folk music. I would love to send the list of uh, music tips, actually. I made a Spotify playlist where you can yes. hear. Yes, know. yes, that would be lovely. Then I can uh, post that on the on the event page so that uh, every all the other people who have attended, we can just go through the references yeah. that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think the same, uh, these Hedningana girls, these two girls, they have the same technique as many Slavic traditional singers also do. This nasal, like you just, you go really high pitched and um, uh, thin in a way. Uh, and that makes it easy to, to be heard and you can sing very rhythmically with it. So it's a whole, it's a whole world of genres uh, to, to play with. And I think I know now that when you, uh, when you know the basics of many things, it's easier to incorporate it in your, um, in your vocabulary as a singer. Uh, and you can, like, like you have a nice bookshelf of favorite books, you can be like, okay, I have this tune and now, oh, what if I pick out this little technique and, and see how that adds to, to the feeling of the, of the song. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, did I ask you a question there? Yes, kind of yes, you definitely did. You definitely did. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, I want to ask one more question where, uh, what do you think is the significance of percussions in, in, uh, you know, in, in your culture? Yeah, yeah. Well, rattles and percussion have been defined as uh, meaningful from the earliest ancient cultures we have excavated. And uh, uh, Natasha probably also knows tons of stuff that have been found in Siberia because based on the number of items, we can see that uh, percussion have, been, have had a big significance in, in ancient cultures. And I think the significance of beats in general, um, it, yeah, it's uh, pretty primal. I think it's pretty primal, even with with the uh, with uh, African tribes. I think it's the yeah. sense of rhythm is something that we have. Like one of the first things we have is our heartbeat. So I exactly. think that is. Yeah, it's non-debatable that it's important. Um, and all humans, even those without hearing, reacts on rhythmic vibration. It creates a change in the brain waves, often causing heightened awareness. Uh, this is measurable by neuroscientists, you know, so there's definitely, uh, definitely something going on. Um, and it's, it's what I would define as a core feeling. Like we feel the beat reverberating deep in our core and it makes us feel brave and powerful. And it's a very powerful tool to use in a live setting with many drums and a lot of beats uh, with the symbiosis with all the people attending and the volume from the sound system and the light show following the beats. It all brings us to this trance-like state, which, which is a lovely place to be. And I also came to another interesting observation, um, like the Big Bang as being the first beat. And yeah. the explosion of time and space that sets yeah. matter in motion uh, as a vibration. It fits perfectly with, uh, actually with the Sanskrit expression with roots in the Vedic spirituality, Nada Brahma, which, yeah, which basically just means sound is God, or in other words, sound is the central concept. And the Vedic is such a beautiful ancient tradition, and I really trust that something they talked about there has a lot of significance also. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think uh, Hinduism, like a lot of lot of texts in Hinduism and a lot of texts in, in Norse mythology, has a lot of parallels. They're pretty similar. I think uh, apart from apart from uh, Nordic culture, right now Hinduism is the oldest form of uh, paganism which is still surviving in the modern day world. 
the ideas of that of it has has uh, changed like it than what it was before but the main crux of it was very similar to what norse mythology was the, the use of a lot of drums the, the importance of sound uh, even even with the gods and the goddesses that we worship it's very it's very like it's very similar to the concepts of uh, any norse mythology which is something that i have this question for natasha saved for the q and a session that she has found actually like she has found some significant parallels in it so i'll go go to that when the session when the q and a starts so for now what I'll, i i want to ask you is when you were talking about you know hitting those high notes so i think it's sometimes as music, as vocalists we have this general tendency of being scared and when we go go try to hit the high notes we try to shift into falsetto because mm-hmm. because i think falsettos are safer because we are we are so scared sometimes to you know use our voices we are scared that what if what if i i i uh, overstress myself or overstress yeah. the voice so what yeah. tips do you have for people uh, who want to use their throat voice or their head voice to reach yeah. those high notes i would say um think opposite like when you think i need to 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 really tighten myself to reach up here think the opposite no loosen up relax uh, and just tight just uh, the tighten the right muscles not the wrong ones you know like if you're doing an exercise with your with your uh, st- stomach you shouldn't strain your neck it's the same when you're singing if you want to reach high you shouldn't you shouldn't strain too much so that's maybe the the biggest trick i have in the book and also really really don't underestimate all the power of your muscles especially those in the back and the way to find them is actually to stand against the wall and and push gently and then you will you will kind of get a grip of of your back muscles so if you if you get a grip on those and you try to relax but still um you know tighten the tighten the right places oh god i need some more vocabulary for it. <laughs> i'm sure you can explain it better you are <laughs> No, no, definitely it makes sense because I think when we are singing, we are also trying to because the, with with our throat is it's an instrument that we can't see, we can't touch, we don't know what like so it, it's like you said when you began the uh, when you were talking about how you found uh, your voice, it's not just your voice which which is working, it's like it's your entire body is is the instrument. I think yes. we restrict ourselves when we think it's just it's just my voice, it's just my lungs, or it's just my back. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's the whole uh, it's a whole body experience. Yeah, I I've even even heard of vocal coaches uh training people to sing high notes by just raising their hands and mm-hmm. making yeah. them sing. So it's it's I think it's like an entire body, your entire body is involved in singing. Yeah, 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 yeah. For sure, for sure. Okay. Uh so for the next question, I think we have a few questions here. Uh, we have a question about uh, how how you approach arranging your vocal melodies. So when you are given for example if Kai and George come to you and they have okay we, we have these beats, we have these uh, sounds that we have made. How do you how do you uh, approach your arrangement when uh, vocals wise? So what do you think of when you are arranging your vocal uh, solos and lyrics? Yeah, well, it's it's very different from Yusin and Heilung. Uh, Yusin is a progressive, more modern electronic project. And when I work with Yusin and composing melodies, I always think, uh, again, I think opposite. I think like, oh, the natural thing would be to go like, ah, oh, but then I will go like, ah, la, la, you know, I would do something crazy. That's my, that's like my main goal there just to experiment uh, and uh, think uh, non-traditional and with Heilung it's a completely different story because there of most often I would say nine out of ten times Kai presents us uh, pieces of lyrics that he dug up in his massive library uh, or have been uh, writing spending years uh, writing himself uh, and most often those lyrics are in ancient uh, language um so there is a language which um where the words don't really dictate uh, the meaning uh, at first glance i would just look at it and i would see sounds and these lyrics w- will will then actually di- dictate where the melody should go so i start i start actually <laughs> 
almost every time I have the melody on the first on the first go, I would just I would just read it and I would just sing whatever falls into my mind. And it feels really spiritual actually because it's like it's like a it just falls falls in my mind and I'm in all of a sudden I'm I'm not here anymore. I'm trancing out somewhere and it's it's a very interesting way to to work with building melodies um we're also experimenting with something uh secret right now i wish i could talk about it because so that's okay next session yeah <laughs> definitely, definitely uh and i also have one question about uh you, you you don't sing in just one language so you you sing in different languages so are all of these languages your native languages and if not how do you approach singing in a language which you're not comfortable with are you not yeah. speaking yeah good question well i think that the the most interesting story here is uh, nurupu which is a, a text uh, about the norwegian rune poem um and it's basically an introduction to all the runes it's an ancient uh, norwegian poem and in this uh, text which is an old norse uh, which is not my language i don't speak it it's uh, no no one speaks it anymore mm -hmm. but then kai said uh, why don't you just try to pronounce it in your local dialect and uh, i come from a small town in uh, in norway and all of a sudden it was like it became mine in a way when i was pronouncing it it's uh, these old words with just the small little like we have we have instead of say, saying l we say Ur. So instead of saying lo, you say bro. So you have this bra, bra, bra. I don't know if you can hear it. Right. It's, a, it's a subtle little thing, but it makes the whole difference. It makes it makes it mine, and it makes me own it uh, in a way. Uh, for for other uh, texts, I mean, we also use uh, inspiration from Faroese and Icelandic because then they still use some of the letter letters, and we know how to pronounce them. And in Faroese, for instance, two L's becomes T. So we, we, yeah. So it's also free interpretation because we don't know always and we have to just take a leap and say, okay, how does this feel right? Uh, and we don't we don't try to say that we are reconstructing like Natasha also very nicely said in your beginning of your talk Natasha you said that we're not reconstructing we're we are re reinterpreting or we, we're taking something old and making it our own um, and uh, there's lots of really really clever linguists out there who have so many good things to say about pronouncing uh, ancient uh, texts um, we chose to to use our approach where we needed to feel at home in it. Like I'm saying something because I mean it. I don't just read up something. It's right. yeah. Right. Uh, again, coming back to your your uh, vocal solo arrangements, I would like to play one one uh, the your vocal solo from In My Jam, uh, mm -hmm. from the live concert in uh, Lifa. Uh, I, I, I how many of you have heard Lifa? Yeah, I have. <laughs> okay, so I'm sure you guys have heard that vocal solo. It just blew me. It just blew me away. Uh, so I would like to play that, and I, I would like to, you to talk about because I, I noticed there was a ton of interesting transitions. Again, that is something that vocalists, me even me as a vocalist, I I, I have difficulty uh, transitioning from you know falsettos to head voice to chest voice. And you've done like a ton of those. Uh, and you've put together a lot of very interesting sounds. So I'll just play uh, that solo so that those of you who've not heard it can uh, give it a listen. And Maria will break that solo down for us and she'll tell us how she approached it. Okay, so I'll share, share screen. Hold on. Sound this might put down. Yeah. Okay, just tell me if you guys can hear. Can you guys hear it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. So I'll just quickly go to the vocal solo.
So could you could you uh, break down that vocal solo for us? That that monstrous <laughs> vocal solo that it is. <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot for that. That's like uh, enough for a two-hour talk already. <laughs> I'll try <to> quick. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, this is from the song in Maidian. Um, and uh, as I talked about earlier, I made this in a one take in the studio, uh, meaning that after we recorded the song, I had to break it down myself and actually learn how to sing it. Right. To repeat. And I noticed that, this, that the album version is different than the version in Leafa. So it's, it's pretty... It's pretty uh, in Lifa it's pretty uh, you know out there actually yeah the Lifa uh, version is uh, or how it is live now is how I wanted it to be in the recording when I was recording it in one take I was like okay guys cool let's do it again and they were like no no that was perfect and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know sometimes you like you have an idea you want to work yourself right. through it so that's basically what you hear here is, is the recording on Offnet album is, uh, is the one take that the guys really liked and uh, what I'm doing live now is, is the perfectioned, perfectionized version of it, like yeah. how I, I want it to be. So that's good that you get second chances as a musician sometimes. So yeah, let's dive into it. Um, I start in the beginning with using a, a more or less classical Norwegian folk music uh, technique which uh, in, in Norwegian folk music, you, you sing um, mostly quite soft and you have these little uh, curls on, on, on the tones, like, um, uh, also let's see if I can try to do it. So you kind of, you're jumping a bit and making, I'm, I'm calling them curls because I don't have a, a school language for it. <laughs> it's probably something really smart word for it. So, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's used a lot in traditional Norwegian folk songs, um, which is beautiful also. Um, and then um, I go uh, I go into the lock technique uh, or kulning. It's uh, many words for it, but it originates from origin is from you need to call the cattle home at the evening uh, or the sheep or the cats or the dogs or, the cats, or whatever. Definitely. You're <laughs> My cats go crazy when they when they hear kulning. They are like, who's calling? Yeah. <laughs> Probably very high pitched for them, yeah. Yeah. yeah so imagine you're standing uh, on a mountain top, and uh, and your cows are on the far end of the other valley. You need something that's really, really going out there to for them to hear that now it's time to come home. Uh, so uh, that's how the technique they developed in the first place, and it's basically you just go. You go in the, um, I think it's the, uh, I think it's the ch chest where you say, because it's not, so it's not the high register, but you still, and when you uh, shake your mouth to make it more, um, space, to make it more, uh, uh, oh God, what's the English word for that? You're not high pitched, but you have a, uh, so it's, yeah, it's so you make right. it more clear and, and out right. there. It I'm projects not, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I'm blowing your guys' speakers out. <laughs> no, you're not. Okay. Let me know. We can take it. We can take it. Even if you do it, we can take it. Because it's quite a it's quite a high a high sound, right. and uh, when you go even higher in the in the tonality in pitch it gets it increases in volume as well so um i can imagine that you know each set of cattle knew their own melody so every ha everyone had their own uh, different uh, way of uh, me melody to sing to the to the cattle but now the technique is is a combination of uh, of what i explained before about norwegian traditional little curls and this high pitched so it would be like you know where you 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 jump and you have this uh high so i think a good way if you want to try to practice it is just to go 
and then try to decide on a, on a lower or a higher note and do the jumps because it's a lot about the jumping. Yes. It, uh, and I think that's also what, what makes it sounds impressive that you, you can use it rhythmically. And, uh, but actually, you sh to make it sound right, you shouldn't be too perfect on the beat. You should be a little bit uh, in your own tempo in it. So it can be like you hear in, in Median, there is a beat going, but I'm also floating a bit around it and then meeting the beat again and then floating around it. So from the lock and the kulning, um, I also go into some, uh, some animal sounds, which is a very used technique in, uh, in many native uh, singing techniques. Um, and I know that in Siberia, there's beautiful ways of imitating uh, horses specifically and also birds. Um, and for me, I think it just started with me experimenting and then finding this, <laughs> this which yeah. you also Arabic cultures for uh, for yelling out your pleasure and I think also in uh, in India some parts of India yes and uh, Bengal uh, there is the goddess Kali so whenever we worship the goddess we do this we roll the tongue and yell out so it almost so, sounds Ulu. like yeah it, that, that is a, like Ooh! it's this song. Yeah. yeah yeah right where you use the tongue because yeah. what I do only really going on in this in the throat in the actually. throat, throat. Yeah. Yes. yeah that's so, why we call it ulu as well because it, the l the l's so it, it, it signifies the, the 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 rapid movement of the tongue around your mouth of course yeah no 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 yeah it, yeah it, basically you, you move your tongue sideways and you go into a falsetto and you just move your tongue sideways oh sideways sideways <laughs> Oh, cool! <laughs> I can't believe I'm doing this live on Facebook. <laughs> I'm gonna practice that. Maybe you can implement this in your next album. Yes, you should yes. definitely. That will, that will be there. <laughs> cool. That's so cool. So, so yeah. So there's lots to take from uh, from different animal sounds, and I I love that you have. If you if you know a few, then to incorporate it into music because I think sounding like a chicken is not specifically <laughs> cool, you know, <laughs> but you know, I don't know if I would make a full song about it, um, but maybe there's parts of sounding like a chicken, which is, can be incorporated to become music. Um, yeah, and then um, I am very, very grateful for the many talented the Sami singers out there who have um, introduced me to the technique of yoik, which I tried to ask a, a Sami uh, woman at one point if uh, if she could teach me how to yoik because I, I've just I've been listening to a lot of music and I wanted to kind of oh get a professional to to show me, and she was like no, no that's that's. <laughs> Not possible because uh, yeah no it's not it's not just even a secret that's the funny part because yoik is so personal right. that you will uh, only um, you will only uh, yoik from something that happened to you very personally or something you care deeply about um, okay. like if you are sad that this lake has been uh, is gone because they are building a, a water uh, the power uh, plant there, you know, the, you can yoik to that lake and you have, you yoiking your feelings into, into the sorrow of losing this lake or your grandmother has died or you are yoiking for uh, improving the health of your cousin or there's it's always a significant meaning. So what she actually meant was that she couldn't teach me any of her yoiks because that was very personal. But of course, by listening to what they're doing um, in, in their music, you can kind of get a grip on where, where it originates. It's, it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of uh, chest and stomach and oh, hey, hey. So also almost like native uh, Americans use some of the same techniques where you, oh, hey, 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 like you, right. you go, uh, from high to low, uh, quite rhythmically. They also many many use a little bit of throat singing uh, in it. 
And uh, for, for me, when incorporating just a little gram of what, I mean, I'm from the south of Norway, so I don't, uh, I don't have it in, in my blood as such, but I love the courage that this technique is giving me because for me, it feels like I'm, I'm using my, uh, my, my lower, uh, lower power in a way. I'm, I'm pulling up from the ground into my stomach and, and getting it out. And it's, it's a very physical technique that it makes me feel very connected to, to the earth. And, uh, and it's pleasant. It's pleasant for the voice. It's pleasant for the mind. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, I think, um, and the, the last technique uh, that I'm using in, in, in Median is, uh, is growl bordering on throat singing, but I've never mastered throat singing. So, um, so, but, but I can do, you know, that where you get the, 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 the throat rolling and it's a very, very nice technique also to, to use as a spice on, on something just to get the power in there. And I think that's a lot, what to sum it up, uh, the whole in maiden piece, it's, it's a, a spiritual and physical experience to sing it because you have to, you have to have your feet deeply planted on the ground and your head full up uh, in the sky and your body somewhere in between where you are in balance with uh, with what is going on physically um so so i think all these native vocal techniques are it, it's a gift to to be able to hear so many of them i mean imagine before we were able to travel the world and have spotify and listen to all the cultures from around the world we only knew what our little tribe were, were doing and that was probably super cool and all you needed but we are fortunate to live in a connected world where we can learn from each other and i would say i'm like natasha also said I'm, i think it's so cool that it's a lot of folk and uh, tribal uh, bands popping out uh, around the, the world these days we see a more connection to where people feel connected to nature and their roots and history and it's exciting and it gives joy and i think we should always just appreciate that and uh, not talk so much about cultural appropriation in this matter because the culture will always be uh, beautiful in itself but let's share let's share the the joy of, of right. our culture so for, like especially with the both with Midland and Melang, I think even though even though like I've read all the comments that there are on the music on your music that you put out, I think the common thing that everyone says that irrespective of where they are from, they feel like there's something there which which is so primal, which which is very difficult to culturally appropriate. You can't say like I'm 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 from India so I can't resonate with that because that's not my culture. But when I listen to it, it I can't it, it's undeniable it's very difficult to uh, separate what i'm feeling from what i'm thinking because yeah. it's 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 so primal in its nature and especially i i think i have also one uh, have, have one question about the stage act uh, how 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 do you think your entire stage setup the way you dress the the, the, the headgears that you wear I, the, even even the even the mic stands are made of uh, have bones and uh, you know skulls on it how do you think that that contributes to the way you perform on stage yeah well see that's that's the interesting part of Hylong compared to other projects that i've been part of is that it's as the much it's just as much a, a performance as it is a concert and uh, i'm saying that in um, full of awe because uh, ancient rituals, uh, the, the meaning of the word ritual is actually theater for the gods. You are performing a, a rite for, for the gods and you are, you are giving your best sacrifice to, uh, to even either honor them or, or ask for fertility or whatever it is. So, um, so going on stage performing a live ritual was super nerve-wracking for us in the in the beginning because we're all uh, spiritual persons and it's a very it's a very private thing for me I, I never used to talk about it at all it was, I was super super shy about it 
But um, so it didn't feel, it, it felt very strange to, to take that private thing up on a public space or in front of thousands of people um, and still keep your, uh, yourself uh, in it. But the magic thing happened at uh, Castlefest when we recorded Lifa that it felt so right. It felt so extremely calm and exciting at the same time. Um, it felt very, we felt very true to ourselves um, and also about the fact that the audience are not, um, they're not spectators to our concerts, they're participants in the ritual. So it becomes this circle of, um, yeah, of uh, we're giving each other inspiration and feeding from each other's energies, um, and the spirits are, are also very present. Uh, and uh, it, it it feels extremely, extremely uh, nice. Um, I also uh, must say that the the outfits uh, outfit that specifically I can talk from myself only, but. I know that the others feel the same. That my my dress is uh, it's not a costume; it's a regalia. It's uh, my oldest Viking dress that I remade because I had just a I wouldn't call it a vision, but when we talked about going live with Heil Ung, it was very clear to me instantly how I wanted to to be. I wanted to be all natural white colors, uh, shells from my childhood beach. The horse hair is strings from violin bows that are used. So I wanted to have the music woven into the outfit and these traditional woven patterns that we have found in the graves close to my birthplace in Norway. And I mean, the, the headpiece I had just also like, I want to have antlers on my head. I just had this like, I just, I just want to, to have this crown of, of antlers. And I found them and I, fitted them and it just it felt so right also and the only thing that i uh, that i i remember specifically seeing is is the grave from siberia where i was i was like wow how can that be that i that i made this headpiece and then i see that it's that it's what what this is what you do <laughs> so you know it's 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 a bit it's a mix of um of my own imagination and, and uh, influences that all melted together and makes it feel very easy to, to perform this music because the suit, the, the regalia is guiding me in, in my movements and the headpiece is kind of royal. So it's, it's easy to, to be calm and centered in it. Thank you so much, Maria. This was a lovely session. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, we have twenty. We have uh, twenty-three minutes uh, for this meeting to end. So I'd like to open the session up for Q and A's now. Uh, we have had a lot of questions in the chat as well. Now you can, guys can uh, ask those questions. Just raise your hand. I'll select one by one, and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible in twenty-three minutes. Five minutes before, like two minutes before the session ends, I'll I'll say stop, and then we'll say end the session and just say thank you to everybody. Yeah, uh, so, uh, I have few questions. I would like uh, to say something. Just hold on one second, uh, sure. Rajiv. Uh, we yeah. are because there are quite a few people who have not yet uh, asked questions. Uh, Alex has been waiting for quite some time. Alex, you go. Unmute uh, your mic. Yeah. You hear me? Yeah. Okay. So there's. It's a question for both of you girls. The, there's many different names and many different techniques we, we, which imply the using of the false chords or, or however you want to call them, or different uh, primal sounds, you know. Uh, the, the, some Germans call it the strophas, the, the sub, subharmonic singing, the kargira. There are many, many different ways to, to call it. But the thing is that they are not exactly they don't they do not sound exactly the same so uh it i it it could be a thing of the different voices that each voice uh, each instrument resounds in a sounds in a different way so i was wondering if you girls know any literature about it like any mentions of the any mention any all the mentions of different ways that that kind of singing could be done natasha yes 
what about trout sink? Yes, it is many, many different types. Mongolian trout sink, it is different that Kargara in, um, in Tuva. Yes, we, we know three main techniques. Sigrid, it's like something like this. It is higher uh, Kargara, uh, I was showed it. And how may I, my own, it is only Kargara. I can, um, um, I can told you, tell you about the difference with other techniques because I not own it. I am own only Kargara. Yes, it is very different uh, styles, very different elements, some new ones. You know, you, you must find this information in through real sources. <laughs> Thank you. I was I was kind of thinking about concretely concretely the, the low end, you know, but with, with this vocal fry and all all those different ways to call it. And but thank you. That that was I guess that was an answer. Okay, uh, Rajiv, uh, you go next. Uh, also, guys, you can keep your hands raised from the participant section. There is an option for raise hand. So if you can keep your hands raised, then I'll just choose randomly and please don't be mad at me if I don't choose you. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, first of all, I'm grateful to True School of Music for uh, bringing this session and yeah, letting us uh, have an amazing interaction with these amazing people. Uh, so I, for the past three years, I have been into Norse mythology and the inspiration is, uh, of course, Highland. And I got into it more and more through this Norwegian singer called Einar Selvik from Vardruna. And uh, as an, when I watched the Viking series, I uh, went into it more and more and saw the music video. So the Krigsgalder was the first uh, music that I heard from Highland. And it was, I was like so shaken that, I mean, what kind of music is this? Some ethereal music. I haven't heard something like this before. So that's when I started going deep in Highland and Vardruna. So uh, I have this question about runes. So now uh, we have these runes that ends in Z, right? Uh, you have Hagalas, you have Uruz, uh, Turisas. So these runes, they also have a pronunciation that ends with R. So uh, could you just tell me in which timeline this pronunciation changed? Oh, that's uh, a specific um, uh, scholar question, I would say. Uh, I could not answer when that shift happened. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm sure uh, there is information on the on the internet about it if you try to I, type in. Yeah, I don't so, know, Nat you know. Sorry? Natasha, do you, uh, how schooled are you in the wisdom of, of the runes, uh, different rune alphabets? Well, the, uh, the first time runes, for example, Kutark, it is only letters. Yeah, the question. What? Yeah, so in, in my dear and in your song, you have all those runes chanting, Fehu, Urus, Tuisas. So you end with said. Whereas in case of Vardruna, there is this album called Runaliud Ikrasi. So in there, the names of the songs are Urur, Naudir, in that sense. So I just want to know, like, what's the difference in the pronunciation? Even I have read books about it, mostly it ends with said. So I just want to know, like, uh, where did the shift happen? Yeah, but there is, uh, there is so much different uh, opinions also about the different pronunciations and when stuff happened that I think it's not, uh, the, not easy for us to come with, a, with one single answer to that question. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no issues. I also want to know, uh, is paganism now so active in all the Scandinavian countries? And adjoining to that question, uh, do you worship Christianity more or the uh, old gods more? So that, um, you said for, uh, yeah, me first? Yeah. Okay, so uh, if paganism is bigger than Christianity in Europe, was that the question? Yeah, now, it's, uh, now because of all the entertainment that is bringing the Viking culture back, 
and exposing its rules through music and all of the stuff. So I seldom wonder that uh, <coughs> if there are people who still worship those old gods, and mm-hmm. I don't know if, it, if there is some controversy thing or you know mm-hmm. people got con- converted into Christians in the late uh, 13th century. So now what's the status about it? Are there any temples apart from Temple of Uppsala in Sweden? They recently built a temple on Iceland for paganism and uh, there is a grow the, the community is is growing for sure i think as many nature religions across the world it's gaining more and more uh, focus as we start to be more and more aware that we need to take care of this uh, mother earth of ours so uh, so definitely um there is, there is a rise in in the um, in, in the paganism uh, societies around uh, Europe, I know that for sure. Uh, my personal beliefs, I, I believe in uh, uh, more. I'm more over to the pagan side than the, the Christian side. But I, I believe every uh, every man or woman for him or herself. And uh, I don't I don't want to go into a discussion about what is <laughs> what is what. Uh, everyone should do as they feel uh, in their heart is the right thing to do. Thank you so much. Finally, I just want to request all, all you, all the Norwegian bands to collaborate and please come to Mumbai <laughs> just once. I really yeah, wish we are you. working on that once the lockdown ends. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll definitely grab some people who are willing to do that. Okay. Uh, Thank you. We'll move on to George. Oh. He's been waiting for some time. <laughs> Hello. Well, I've, I've answered that original question myself now, but I did have a question for Maria, if that's okay. Um, Basically, I've, I've seen you live a few times now and the, the energy when you perform is amazing. And I just wondered how you approach taking that energy into the studio when it's quite a sterile environment and how you can recreate that kind of feeling of live and, and give a performance. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, but it's, uh, I would say it's easy when we have these surroundings that we, we have because we are uh, mostly only three people working and we uh, light incense and uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, green and um, there is, a, I can give you a small tour so you can see. I hope the web is okay because our recording room is actually a really pleasant place to to stay uh, oh, wow. we have a, like a <laughs> thick carpet uh, we're standing bare feet and yeah. uh, the atmosphere is really uh, uh, nice and warm and uh, yeah. yeah yeah so it's, and also you know that the, the Christopher sitting on the other end in the uh, control room has a very soothing nice and <laughs> Uh, um, encouraging uh, way of talking. Uh, so uh, for me, it feels very, very uh, uh, pleasant. I feel very much like myself. It's easy to get into. Um, yeah. For Kai, he normally takes a, a shawl and cross of his eyes. He uh, runs around in circles uh, using a lot of noise and instance, calling to the spirits tripping out uh we often we just we let him be in the control room we shut the door and then push record and then an hour later we try to <laughs> wake him up again so you know we have different ways to approach recording great thanks okay uh so next we have nicholas nicholas with his very nice background he's already in the zone <laughs> First of all, thank you very much for actually making that music. You opened up a whole world for me that I can't stop looking at now. Um, why do you put on sightless in your eyes? Nicholas, your, your, your volume is pretty low. Can you come a little closer to the mic? Can you hear me now? Still pretty low. I think you might have to speak louder. No, try to, ask, try to uh, you, you can write it on the chat and I can just uh, or yes. talk really into the mic. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if I'm going to go. I put the question there earlier. It's about Hamra Hippia. Why is it so effective in not just healing physically but spiritually as well? It's well, uh, a question. I don't know why it does. Uh, I don't know if that was your intention. 
that part at the end of a concert or yeah yeah i also read your question on the chat so i'm, I'm getting it about tamra hippie um and uh, yeah well the spell we use there is the spell for healing uh, wounds and uh, bones so everything broken should be whole again and we finish with that explosion of of energy uh with this spell as also a um a, a relief from from pain because we know that many of the pieces during uh, the performance or the ritual is intense and hard to sometimes hard for for the physical and the spiritual side of you so we want to finish with hammer hippie to give that give that relief from both phys physical and and um, mental uh, pain basically it's it's a relief and uh, of course, live it's also um, it's also an explosion for us because we give it all, and the warriors throw themselves into the audience, and we're all dancing together. And it's yeah, you should go home with a little black smeared all over after. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, any more questions? There are so many people that to like scroll through. Okay, no more questions from anybody else. I have one question for Natasha. Mm -hmm. Natasha, uh, can you tell us, like, is there is there any parallels that you found between Indian mythology and Norse mythology in your studies? Sorry, can you repeat? <laughs> have you have you found have you found any parallels between Indian mythology and Norse mythology in your studies as a historian? Uh, no, many many religions have some um, similar elements. I, um, I do not study these aspects in university and you know um, I did not study religion and I think this question uh, for, for maybe qualified specialist of course, I can come up with something. <laughs> Some of you uh, will even believe me. You know, uh, in university I study only usual life of the Viking, of the Scandinavians. Yes, and I research some um, some issue with women's women's in Scandinavian parade yes uh, about religions maybe yeah maybe i think it's it's maybe similar maybe it is something connection okay no. okay thank you natasha uh, maxwell has a question and before maxwell i have one question which has been waiting for quite some time uh, the question is for both Maria and Natasha. Uh, it's about the mics that you prefer to use to record your vocals and in life. Maria? So I think Maria can go first and then Natasha can tell us. Oh, yeah, I wish, uh, <laughs> I wish I could answer that because we tried, uh, we, we have a different uh, setup now, so I'm not actually sure. What's the name of the? We use wireless on stage, uh, okay. and now in the studio uh, we are. Was it live or studio? Both. Both. Yeah. So in the studio we got this amazing new one. Maybe you know. And I'm glad for nerdy questions, but I'm actually not sure what. It is a Townsend. Townsend. Okay, so that's a condenser. Townsend, right? And the live, I'm so ashamed <laughs> that I answered that question. I sing into it. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Natasha, do you do you uh, do you uh, have any preference regarding yeah, mics? This one for recording, it is SM7B sure. Sennheiser. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 7B. Seven seven yes, I like yeah. this microphone for for vocal. It is, I think, it is the best. And for live show, we used Shure. Um, SM58? <laughs> sure. <laughs> SM58. Uh, Probably SM58. That's the go-to for. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> I think it works for, for, for almost all, all kinds of vocals. Okay, thank you so much, Maria and Natasha. One last question from Maxwell. 
Hi. So um, my question is for Maria. I, first of all, I've been like a, I've been a huge fan of Highland for a very long time. It's had a very, uh, a very deep effect on my life. Um, I saw you guys live in Los Angeles, and uh, <laughs> it was it was an amazing show. Uh, but uh, I have a very short question about the instruments that you use on stage. Um, and I noticed that in a lot of uh, Nordic groups, they use instruments like tagal harpas and nikal harpas and things like that. But you use this bowed instrument that seems like it, it only has one string coming down the center. Um, uh, finally, it has oh, Thank you so much yeah. for asking. I actually took it here. <laughs> yes, yes, that one. Yeah. Thanks for asking because this is so fun for me being called up from Mumbai because this is an Indian instrument. It's a Ravan Hata and it's a, they also call it a desert sitar um, and you are very right. It is one string that you play on which is made from horse hair. Actually it was human's hair when I got it because the builder he always stole a little from his daughter. She had beautiful long black hair uh, but now I replaced it with horse hair. Horse hair. And it has uh, um, a number of, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you call it um, resonance strings. And the body is a coconut shell and it's goat skin on the top with a bridge and then uh, tuning pegs. So I traveled uh, three times to India for uh, one and a half year together almost. And uh, on my first trip was a musical journey where I traveled through for six months. I traveled from north to east to Andaman Islands to everywhere. And everywhere I came, I tried to pick a folk instrument and learn how to play it. And when I came to Rajasthan, uh, the desert area of India, I found uh, that the gypsy tribes there uh, played this instrument beautifully. So I found the guy who built them and he built it for me and uh, he taught me how to play it. But it's quite challenging to, to play it nicely. So uh, I, I used it very uh, sim simpli sim simplified in Heilung with, with one, one tone. But yeah, so that's, it's a bit of a, a weird mix that we deal with Nordic music and we have an Indian instrument in our uh, 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 instrument collection. But I find that it's, uh, it is, is, it's as ancient as it might be something we could have come up with in the North at that same time, because the principle of it is so, so simple and, and ge genius. We didn't have coconuts though, but maybe we <laughs> use something. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria and Natasha. It was lovely. It was like, I, I was fangirling the entire time I was talking to these two uh, while uh, organizing this masterclass. I'm so glad. It's like a dream come true to have you to give a masterclass my school. And thank you everybody for those of you who joined from different parts of the country, different parts of the world. I think this has been, I think this was the first, this was the first online masterclass we have ever had. And you guys made it a success and I'm really glad that you're here and that you uh, attended this masterclass. And tomorrow we have one masterclass on acoustics, on the basics of room acoustics. If you guys are interested in attending that, you can just go to the TSM page. You can sign up for that as well. And thank you so much for coming here. I, I can't say good night because it's different, it's different time zones everywhere. Good wherever, good whatever, wherever you are. <laughs> And thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Thank you so much, Maria and Natasha. We're hoping <laughs> to see you back sometime again. Thank, thank you so you. much. <laughs> 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 <laughs>